We're beginning a new series today that is dealing with the subject of cover to cover, Jesus in all the Bible. And this is one of my favorite subjects because uh, the Bible really is about Christ. Now you might be asking, how, how long is this series going to go? Some young people were asking backstage, I said, I don't know. Because there's a lot of stories and a lot of characters in the Bible, uh, Old Testament mostly, some New Testament, that are teaching us about Jesus and the plan of salvation. But uh, this is going to be a great time, I think, for us to get a really good panorama of the Bible. The, the whole Old Testament is a kaleidoscope that when you focus it, it gives us different facets and pictures of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be doing during this series. You know, um, chameleons are some of the strangest creatures in the natural world. They look a little bit like they were dropped from an alien spaceship. Uh, you think about it, first of all, they come in a, a pastel of different colors. They're very strange in that they've got these skin cells that can change colors and adapt to other creatures. Um, they've got three or four toes on each hand, uh, unlike other creatures. They move very slowly. But even though they move very slowly, they can capture their prey with their tongue. Their tongue can stick out and snatch away uh, a dragonfly or some bug. The tongue can be uh, one and a half times the length of their entire body. And the tongue can rock it out from their body and capture its prey in about a thousandth of a second. They rarely miss because they've got these very interesting eyes. One of the strangest things about a chameleon, their eyes are located on like these rotating turrets and they have 360 degree vision around their bodies. They can look forwards and backwards at the same time. Now, if you try and do that, you're gonna look very peculiar. Um, and their eyes can move independently from each other. If you're talking to somebody and they do that, it's kind of disconcerting, right? <laughs> their eyes can move independently of each other, or when they see something they like, they can focus them in like binoculars, which is why they very rarely miss their prey when they shoot out their tongues. And so uh, they've got like this double vision. In our series we're about to begin, I'd like to ask you to have double vision. Now the Bible stories and the Bible history, they're all uh, true and relevant and accurate, but God has done something miraculous in the Bible in that in the stories you find the gospel echoed through all the characters and the stories of the Bible. Every story in the Bible you can find the villain, the victim, and you can find the valiant. And you should be looking at the stories in the Bible to see this history. Now, I'd like to start with a little amazing fact. I don't know if some of you have ever seen this analogy that was done before between the last few days of Lincoln and of Kennedy. Listen now, see what you think. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John F. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. Lincoln was elected president in 1860. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. It's just coincidental. Lincoln's wife lost a child while living in the White House. Kennedy's wife lost a child while living in the White House. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy who urged him not to go to the theater. Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln who urged him not to go to Dallas. It's getting kind of weird. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were shot in the back of the head in the presence of their wives. Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contained seven letters. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were killed on Friday and were both assassinated by Southerners. Lincoln's assassin was known by three names, John Wilkes Booth, comprised of 15 letters. Kennedy's assassin was known by three names, Lee Harvey Oswald, comprised of 15 letters. Booth shot Lincoln in a theater and fled to a warehouse. Oswald shot Kennedy from a warehouse and fled to a theater. Both Oswald and Booth were killed before being brought to trial. 
Lincoln's successor was Andrew Johnson, born in 1808. Kennedy's successor was Lyndon Johnson, born in 1908. Coincidence? Probably. But um, history sometimes had a tendency to repeat itself. Someone asked Mark Twain one time, does history repeat itself? He said, no, but it rhymes. <laughs> and so you can sometimes see history repeating itself. You definitely see this in the Bible. Now, I'm just going to jump to an example as a sample of what we're going to be doing. If you look in the Bible in Genesis chapter 12, I invite you to go there. In Genesis chapter 12, God is speaking to Abraham, and we've got... Uh, We've got more time we're going to spend with Abraham a little later, but this is something of a preview. And you can see here, oh, I'll start with verse 10 in Genesis 12. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went to Egypt. That sound familiar, going to Egypt during a famine? To dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it'll happen when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. Please say you're my sister, that it might be well with me for your sake, that I might live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, and she was very beautiful. And the princess, she must have been really beautiful, because she's like 60 now. And the princes of Pharaoh saw her, and they commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, his wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister, that I might have taken her as my wife? Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So here you've got Abraham goes down to Egypt during a time of famine. The Pharaoh takes uh, his wife, and then these plagues come on Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh sends Abraham away with great wealth. Do you see that repeating itself later? If you've got any doubts, look in Genesis 15 and go to verse 13. God is speaking to Abraham about what's going to happen in the future. And he said, Abram, no, certainly, Genesis 15, verse 13, Abram, no, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and inflict them 400 years. Also, that nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward, and they will come out with great possessions. Now, did that happen? It happened in the life of Abraham, which was a type or a symbol or an echo of what was later going to happen to Israel going to Egypt during a time of famine, being taken advantage of, great plagues fall, they're sent out with great substance. You see what I'm saying? You're going to find not only the story of the Exodus is repeated many times in the Bible, uh, different vignettes of it, but You'll also see the story of salvation all through the Bible. It's, uh, it's made very clear. So uh, in our scripture reading, we gave some verses that help bear this out, and I want to look at some of those, talking about the types and shadows that we see in scripture. Now, when uh, Philip first found Jesus, he then goes to Nathanael, and what does he say? We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth. Moses and the Law and the Prophets wrote about Jesus? I don't think Jesus appears till the New Testament. How could they be writing about them? Did they only write about them in a couple of prophecies like in Isaiah when it said the Messiah would come or when Moses said the Lord will raise up a prophet like me, Deuteronomy 18? Or is it all the way from Moses through the prophets? If you look in John 5:39, how did Jesus tell us to read the Bible? He said to the religious leaders, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they that testify of me. The scriptures testify of Jesus. Now there was no New Testament when Jesus said that. So if you want to find out about Jesus, we always think you have to go to the New Testament. 
And I've been in a lot of churches where they'll provide a Bible for their people and all they've got is the New Testament in the back of the uh, pew. But they're missing the Bible that Jesus read and they're missing the Bible where Moses and all the prophets wrote about Jesus. That's what the scriptures say. Let me give you a few more. Look in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now, we'll be reading more of 1 Corinthians in another presentation. But Paul here is talking about the exodus and the experience of the Jewish nation. And he says in verse 11, all these things happened to them as examples. How many things? And the word examples there is tupos in uh, Greek. And that word tupos means they are types. They're symbols. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I'm sure you know the story. It's only found one place in the Bible in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus rises from the dead. And of course, he appears to the women in the morning. Later that afternoon, before the sun goes down, two of the disciples that had been in the upper room, they leave. The name of one of them is Cleopas. And they are walking from Jerusalem down to their hometown of Emmaus. It's about seven miles away. And as they're walking down the road, they're very discouraged uh, about, you know, the crucifixion, of course, and that Jesus' body is missing, and the women have had hallucinations of angels, and they don't know what to think, but they're very downcast. And as they're walking down this road, a stranger comes and starts to walk alongside them. The two trails merge, and he joins them on the trail, which is very common back then. You're actually safer if you walk and travel in numbers. And, and he's quiet. And he listens to them as they're talking about the, the devastation of what's happened with Christ's crucifixion. And, and eventually, the stranger, who is Jesus, they don't recognize him, he says, what manner of communication is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And they said, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not heard about these things that happened? Where have you been? This has been the big thing in the nation and in Jerusalem over the Passover. And Jesus said, what things? As though he didn't know. And they said, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a man mighty in deed and word, and how all the people believed in him, and our rulers, and turned him over to the Gentiles, and they crucified him. And, and now the women say that he's been resurrected, and this is the third day since all those things happened, which should have been a sign to them right there. Because Jesus often said after three days he would rise. And then Christ finally speaks. And I think we've got these verses up on the screen. He said in Luke 24, verse 25, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? He was saying this was the plan from the beginning. And notice where he says it. Beginning at Moses and in all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. How many scriptures? Now, when Jesus made that statement, I want you to know there wasn't a single solitary word of the New Testament written. I've just, you can see right here in my Bible. I got a new Bible, I'm excited. New Testament starts here. Three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament. Jesus is saying in Moses and the prophets, and all the scriptures, they all tell about Christ. And I think most people miss most of Jesus that is found in the Old Testament. As Paul went from place to place and he proved to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, what book do you think he used? He used the Old Testament. And he saw Jesus everywhere. And that's how the church grew, through reading of Christ's first coming that was prophesied and illustrated in the stories and the teachings of the Old Testament. And there's another verse I want to share with you. If you look in um, Luke 24, verse 44, same story, a little later in that chapter, he appears now in the upper room. You know, he reveals himself to the disciples there at their home in Emmaus. They finally say, Jesus, and now they have to go tell their friends he's alive, and they're so excited. And he meets them in the upper room and says, peace to you. And this is Luke 24, 44, and 45. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, the Bible says. The whole book is about Jesus. 
Now, I've done it before, as most pastors have. We talk about the Bible, and we tell people, this is your owner's manual. And this has got the list of rules. And you've probably used the illustration, B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. And uh, that's true, but it's not just a list. It's not just an owner's manual. This is actually telling us about somebody. And you need to know that somebody because eternal life is knowing Jesus. John chapter 3, uh, John chapter 17, rather, verse 3. This is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. Christ will declare to the lost, I do not know you. We need to know him. And most people think, well, the best way you'd go to know is you'd read the four Gospels. And I think that's still true. But there's a lot of ways that Jesus reveals himself to us through the stories in the Old Testament, through these shadows and types. So we're going to be going through some of those now, and we're going to start at the beginning with the first man in Genesis. And what was his name? Adam. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about the similarities of Jesus and Adam. Now, that should not surprise you because, of course, Adam is made in the image of God. And who made Adam? All things were made from the Father of the Son. All things that were made were made by him, the Bible says. So Jesus is made, Adam is made in the image of Jesus. By the way, the word Adam means uh, son of the earth or son of the red earth. It's very similar to the word Edom, which means red. And um, it tells us, if you look in Romans 5, I want you to know this is a study that is supported by Scripture. Pastor Doug is not just walking around the Bible like someone looking for water with two willow witching sticks. You've seen that before? Uh, folks, are there, they call it water witching, and they go around and say, ooh, I think I feel it here. Oh, you ought to drill over here. And some people read that, their Bibles that way like it's a private you know, interpretation. And the Scriptures tell us to look for these symbols and types, and they give us examples. Now, I don't want you to think that every time you read about every character in the Bible that that is Jesus. I told you some are the villain. Some represent the church or the victim. And some are the valiant. Some represent Christ. Sometimes it's talking about the bride of Christ. But in the stories of the Bible, you find echoes of the plan of salvation. And I'm just going to, during this series, be giving you some samples of how that works, hoping that it'll strengthen your faith in the Bible and your Bible study as you study the Bible. Okay, Adam is a type of Christ. Romans 5.14, Adam, who is a type. What does that word mean? Tupos, a symbol of him who was to come, speaking of Jesus. First of all, you notice right away that uh, Jesus had a supernatural birth. We all know that. We're reminded every Christmas uh, in those sermons. Did Adam have a supernatural birth? Was Adam born or was he created? There was something supernatural about that. Adam and Christ had no father but God. Thought about that? Both Adam and Jesus are called the sons of God. If you look in Luke chapter 3, it talks about Enos, who was the son of Seth, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. In the midst of the garden was a tree. On Friday, naked, Adam started breathing. Jesus, naked, breathed his last late on the sixth day of the week. They both were, this is both on the sixth day. Adam fell asleep, his side was opened, and his bride came out. Most of us don't get married that way. Jesus, on the sixth day of the week, they opened his side with a spear, and in the blood and water, the church was born. The bride came out. Adam was overcome by the serpent. Jesus defeated the serpent. I'm going to give you several points, and I, I, you're probably not going to be able to write all these down, but uh, maybe I'll post my notes. The dominion was redeemed through Christ, sacrifice, and obedience. The dominion of the world was lost through Adam's disobedience. Adam is created and placed in Eden. Jesus is resurrected in a garden. And you read there in John 19, 41. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, which no man had been laid in. You remember what Mary said when she first saw Jesus? She was weeping outside the tomb. She said, are you the gardener? What was Adam's first occupation? Gardener? And the answer to the question, yes, Adam and Jesus were gardeners. Jesus is the one who planted the garden eastward in Eden. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. For since by man death came, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, I'm, I'm not always saying here that Adam is a type of Jesus, but when you look at Adam and Jesus, if nothing else, you'll see that they are juxtaposed in the Bible, one against the other. Adam fell on the issue of diet in a garden surrounded by a thousand other good options. Jesus overcame on the subject of diet in a wilderness where he was starving. You see how these two are kind of, they're, uh, they offset one another. Let me give you a few more here. The first Adam turned from the Father in the Garden of Eden. The last Adam turned to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam was naked and unashamed in the Garden. The last Adam was naked and bore our shame on the cross. The first Adam's sin brought us thorns. The last Adam wore a crown of thorns, the last Adam being Jesus. The first Adam substituted himself for God. The last Adam was God substituting himself for us. The first Adam sinned at a tree. The last Adam bore our sins on a tree. The first Adam died as a sinner. The last Adam died to free sinners. The first Adam lost the tree of life. The last Adam is the tree of life. The first Adam was the head of the old creation. The last Adam is the head of the new creation. The first Adam was created in God's image. The last Adam is God's image. Let me give you another verse here from the book of Romans. Romans 5, and there's quite a bit in Romans 5 on this subject. Romans 5, verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man, Adam, disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Now, how many of you have noticed that because of the sin of Adam, you struggle with temptation? Is that real? I mean, we feel it every day, right? It is just as real that through Jesus, the second Adam's victory, you can experience righteousness through faith. You can experience a new life. And so uh, these things are not just interesting allegories. These things are actually, through faith, they become real. And you can experience a difference in this in your life. Oh, I wasn't done. I got a couple more on Adam I want to share with you here. The first Adam was alone and needed a counterpart. The last Adam is alone and needs a counterpart. The first Adam was seeking a wife. The last Adam is seeking a wife, the bride of Christ. The first Adam was put to sleep to produce Eve. The last Adam was put to death to produce the church. I sort of mentioned that. The first Adam came out from the ground. The last Adam fell into the ground when he had the cross on his back. The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam died and returned to the ground. The last Adam died and returned to heaven. The first Adam's side was opened. The last Adam's side was pierced. Eve was taken from the first Adam. The church was taken out of the last Adam. Eve was built with the first Adam's rib. The church was built with the last Adam's life. Eve was brought to the first Adam without sin. The church will be presented to the last Adam without sin. Eve was the same as the first Adam in life, nature, and expression. The church is the same as the last Adam in life, nature, and expression. And I could go on. Now, this is just Adam. You don't read a lot about Adam in the Bible. Wait until we get to Joseph. And you, you start seeing, uh, you've got, you know, like 20 chapters in Genesis address Joseph. So I think you're beginning to see how some of this works. But um, we're going to move on here. I'd like to talk next about one of the next characters, and this would be Cain and Abel. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 10. And uh, we'll quickly read this story. It's, it's only a few verses. Now Adam knew his wife. This is verse 1, actually, Genesis 4. She conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Someone was asking if Cain and Abel were twins. I said, well, clearly not. Then she bore uh, another one. This one's name was Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat 
And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Now let me just give you a little background as, as we uh, move through this. After Adam and Eve sinned, they first tried to cover their nakedness. They, you know, before sin, Adam and Eve wore these garments, these robes of light. Their skin glowed with righteousness. And if you look in the Bible, when Moses talked to the Lord, it says his face glowed. And they, he actually had to veil his face. It was so bright that people couldn't even talk to him. Well, after Adam and Eve sinned, the, the glory went away and their nakedness became plainly evident. They were ashamed. They knew something was wrong. And um, they went and made fig leaves. It says that they made mini skirts of fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Now, back then, nothing had died, and, and the fig leaves probably held up a little better than they do now. But uh, God said, that won't work. And then the Lord spoke to Adam, explained the only way for them to be redeemed was through the sacrifice of his son, and that he would establish this sacrificial system to remind them that their sin was going to cost innocent life. And that's when the sacrificial system was established. And this lamb or lambs were sacrificed to provide coats, robes. The word is tunics for Adam and Eve. And so he said, and pass this on to your posterity that until my son comes, until the Messiah, the Christ comes to earth to save you, you will do this when you sin on certain set occasions. The blood of the lamb represents the blood of my son that will come. So they were given clear instructions to follow the sacrificial system. Abel obeyed, and he brought a lamb. Cain thought, well, it's just a symbol. How precise do I need to be to the word of God? As long as, you know, it's similar. Uh, by the way, Abel is a shepherd, and I'm a farmer. He'll bring sheep. I will bring zucchini. And so they, you know, he says, I'm going to do it my own way. So they both build altars, probably within sight of each other. They come to the gates of the Garden of Eden. They build their altars. You know, they've been evicted from the garden. There's an angel with a flaming sword there, and that's where they sort of met with the Lord. And, and um, Cain makes his offering. Fire comes down from God and accepts his offering the way it did for Abel. Sorry, Abel uh, makes his offering of his lamb. Fire comes down from God and consumes and accepts his offering. Cain... He's got his altar and he puts his vegetables and his fruits there. All he gathers is fruit flies. And it says the Lord respected Abel's offering, but he does not respect Cain's offering. And Abel said, you know, brother, I told you. you. You know, he's the older brother, so he doesn't like his younger brother telling him what to do. He says, I told you that we need to follow the word of the Lord. This is what's required. And, and as he tried to remonstrate with his brother and encourage him, Cain became so angry, and God said, sin is at your door. And I guess it happened again, and, and his brother said, Cain, you really need to follow the word of the Lord. And he became angry, and Cain's unrighteousness became angry at Abel's righteousness, and in a rage, he either picked up a stick or a rock, and he killed his brother. And then, of course, he took one of his sisters, and he fled, and he built a city, and later Adam and Eve had other children, but the Bible tells us that Abel, in many ways, is a type of Christ. God tells Cain, he says, the blood of your brother, and this is Genesis 4.10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood speaks to me, cries to me from the ground. The Bible says the life is in the blood. That doesn't mean these little blood cells were talking. It's, of course, a symbol, and that blood of Abel is a symbol for the blood of Christ. Look in Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead, he still speaks. Now, the first person who ever dies, the first human who ever dies, is Abel. Abel is a good shepherd. Is Jesus a good shepherd? You notice that before Abel, the man dies, Abel's lamb dies. Before Christ, the Son of God, dies, there's a sacrificial system and the lambs die. You can also read in Hebrews 12, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. The Bible tells us that Abel's blood speaks, but Jesus' blood speaks better. Abel is the first martyr that you find in the Bible. In fact, 
you read one of the last curses that Jesus pronounces on those that were condemning him. And he says in Luke chapter 11, verse 50, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, might be required of this generation. That was a generation that had rejected Jesus. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, one of the last of the prophets, who perished between the altar and the temple. I say it will be required of this generation. After Jesus made that prophecy, Bible generation is 40 years. Within 40 years, Jerusalem was destroyed and great trials and tribulation came on the Jewish nation. Jesus had all the guilt of all that blood from the blood of Abel to the present. Abel was a type of Christ would be required of those who had rejected, uh, rejected Christ. And that's still true when Jesus comes again. Those who have rejected the blood of the Son of God, it says the wrath of the Lamb falls upon them. So do you see that Abel is a type of Christ? Next you go to Enoch. And you read in Genesis 5, verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch is the first man that the Bible declares, says he walked with God. And of course, by that it means he walked in a consciousness and a communion with God. He walked in the ways of the Lord. And the walk in the Bible means your direction, your obedience. And Enoch does not die because of that. Enoch ascends to heaven in a miraculous way. Did Jesus ascend to heaven in a miraculous way? Did Enoch walk with the Father in a perfect way. Now, all have sinned, including Enoch and Job and others in the Bible, but Enoch had a godly and a righteous life, you see. You read, for instance, in the book of Jude, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, there's only one chapter. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, seven generations from Adam, you get Enoch. After Enoch, you got Methuselah, then you got the flood. You got Lamech, and then you got the flood. And Noah, of course. And it tells us that uh, he's the seventh from Adam. The seventh in the Bible is a symbol for perfection. It says Enoch prophesied. What does that tell us about Enoch? What do you have to be before you can prophesy? A prophet. You with me? So was Enoch a prophet? Was Jesus a prophet? It says Enoch prophesied the Lord was coming. You know what that means? Did Jesus prophesy about the coming of the Lord? You know what a person is when they believe in the imminent coming of the Lord? An Adventist. That's what Adventist means. Enoch was an Adventist. And he was the seventh from Adam. That means he's a seventh Adventist. Is that a stretch? <laughs> I'm sure he did keep the Sabbath because uh, Sabbath was made for man, Adam, back in the beginning. I'm sure Enoch was a seventh day Adventist. Pardon me for plugging that when I have an opportunity. Look in Hebrews 11, verse 5. Paul speaking about Enoch. He said, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Now, stop right there. Friends, if you don't want to see death, if you want to ascend to heaven, how does it happen? By faith. By faith he walked with God. Some people think if I walk with God, then I'll be saved. You've got to have faith. It's by faith you walk with God. By faith he walked with God, and he did not see death, for God took him, for he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, does the Bible say there's someone else that pleased God? What voice comes from heaven at the baptism of Jesus? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Enoch pleased God. Enoch is a type of Christ. You see how this works, friends? We can see uh, types and symbols of Jesus all through the Bible. I'd like to read you a quote, and this is from the book, um, Lift Him, no, oh, That I May Know Him, page 208. This is from that devotional, That I May Know Him, page 208. The Old Testament is as verily the gospel in types and shadows as the New Testament in its unfolding power. The New Testament does not present a new religion. The Old Testament does not present a religion to be superseded by the new. The New Testament is only the advancement and unfolding of the old. Abel was a believer in Christ and was verily saved by his power, as was Peter or Paul. Enoch was a representative of Christ as surely as was the beloved disciple John. That God who walked with Enoch was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was the light of the world then, just as he is the light of the world now. 
The truth for this time is broad in its outlines, far-reaching, embracing many doctrines. But these doctrines are not detached items, which mean little. They are united by golden threads, forming a complete whole with Christ the living center. You know, sometimes people look at a tapestry from the back, and it looks like a tangle of knots and thread. You've got to go around to the other side, and you say, oh, it all forms a picture. And some people read the Bible, and to them, it's like they're looking at the wrong side of the tapestry. And you, through the Holy Spirit, you start to begin to see it's really the picture of Jesus that's conveyed in all of this. All right, let's go now to one of the great patriarchs, the, the um, saviors, you might say, in the Bible. Jesus in Noah, the story of Noah. First of all, the word Noah means rest. What does Jesus say in uh, Matthew chapter 11? Come unto me and I will give you, I will give you rest. And you read in Genesis 6, 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah, like Enoch, walked with God. Noah was just. Jesus, what did Pilate say when Christ was being tried? He says, what shall I do with this just man? He declared him innocent. He declared him just. It also you read in Genesis 6, 18, God says, I will establish my covenant with you. God made a covenant through Noah. By the way, everybody in the world who was saved was saved through Noah. You are here today because of Noah. Did you know that? If it wasn't for Noah, you wouldn't be here. Furthermore, you know, I always think it's interesting. People are really big into ancestry right now. And every now and then I, I get an email from somebody and they say, my name is Bachelor. Do you know so-and-so Bachelor? Are we related? Uh, related every now and then, you know, it turns out there is some connection. Most times not, or I don't know about it. But people are just, it's, it's really fun to find a relative and make that connection. You know what I'm talking about? I got some exciting news for you. You're my brother and my sister. We are all related. Let's see. How many of you are related to Noah? Look at that. We're family. See that? That's exciting. And you're also related to, uh, if you're not related to Noah, I want to talk to you later. <laughs> we're, all, we're all related to Adam as well. So yeah, we're family. So everyone comes together in the story of Noah. Um, if you read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Everyone thinks about Noah as a carpenter. But the Bible says Noah preached. Not only did he preach with his hammer, but he preached with his mouth. He preached with his example. While all the world was saying, you're crazy, you're part of a, a strange sect. You're building a boat on dry ground in a world where it has never rained. And Noah was accused of being odd as Jesus was, no doubt. You read in Genesis 7, verse 1, And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Does Noah save all of his family? You know, some people think Noah must have been a failure as an evangelist because he only saved his family. Well, I'll tell you, you're a success if you save your family. And by the way, that illustrates that everybody who will be saved is part of the family of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, he moved with godly fear, and he prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah was the heir of righteousness, Jesus is the one, he is the son of God, he is the heir of righteousness through which we are saved. The seed of Noah is saved. Only the seed of Christ, the descendants of Jesus, are saved. You must be born again. If you're only born once, you will die twice. You experience a second death. If you're born twice, you only die once. But if you're like Enoch, you don't die at all, which is our goal, amen? I'd like to be alive and remain and be caught up when the Lord comes if uh, I can avoid it. It's, I'd rather avoid the expense of a funeral, wouldn't you? <laughs> God promised all the world to be saved through uh, Noah, and they were. He's a preacher of righteousness. The ark had one door. Jesus said, I am the door. 
Everybody that was saved had to go through that door. And Christ is the only way for us to be saved. The ark was beaten in a storm, but everyone inside was safe. We may go through fiery trials, but Christ goes through it with us. All those inside the ark were preserved. All right, let's move on now. There's much more that could be said about Noah. Can you see how long this uh, series can be? If I go, I'm still in Genesis. And we're going to spend a couple weeks in Genesis. Let's go to Abraham. Abraham is a great type of Christ in the Bible. I think we'll all agree. Abraham leaves his father's house. And he goes into a place that's dangerous. The land of Canaan, beautiful land, but it's filled with... Canaanites and Amorites and Jebusites and termites and everything. And so he goes and he takes this risk and he steps out by faith. Jesus leaves heaven. Abraham leaves his father's house and comes to this promised land. Jesus leaves the promised land and comes to his world to save us. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Abraham took great risk when he brought his family out of those familiar surroundings following by faith. God promised all the world would be saved through the blessed seed of Abraham. The Bible tells us if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's seed. Abraham was a great intercessor. You remember when those angels came with the Lord and they made their way on to Sodom to judge it. And God says to Abraham, will I hide from my friend what I'm about to do? The sin of Sodom has come up before me and they're going to be judged. Abraham, of course, knowing his family lot and, and uh, his children were there. He begins to intercede with the Lord. It's a, it's a very interesting interchange between God and Abraham. And Abraham says, Lord, surely will not the judge of all the earth do right? If you find 50 righteous in the city, wouldn't you spare that city? If you had 50 people that are, that are being a witness there, they might reach others in Sodom and Gomorrah and things can finally be revived. You know, the Bible says we're light, we're salt, we're supposed to influence. And, and the Lord said, no, I won't destroy it for 50. Abraham goes a little further. How about 45? How about 40? How about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And you can see he's, he's pleading, he's interceding to save his family. Jesus, of course, is the great intercessor. Amen. And the nice thing is you know that everything that Abraham asked, God said he would do. He said, even if there's 10, since you ask, I'll spare the whole place for 10. Abraham said, oh, it's got to be 10, no problem. There weren't even 10. Some of our cities are getting to the same place. Abraham is a type of Christ. All the saved come through Jesus. Abraham is a great intercessor. Um, he is a father of many nations, those of the flesh and those of faith. Abraham had children of flesh, meaning Ishmael was not born. It was man-made works. He didn't believe that God was going to give him a son through Sarah, so they ended up using Hagar as a surrogate, and uh, you had Ishmael, and Paul says, Ishmael, he is the child of uh, the flesh, of man-made works. You didn't trust God. Isaac is the miracle child of faith. Later, Abraham had a wife named Keturah, had several children through her. And so there are many who say they are Christians in the world today, but they are children of the flesh. But then there's those who are really children of faith. Something miraculous happens and they have a new birth. Isaac, we'll get to it later, has a miraculous birth. And that is a type of Christ. And then one of the places, of course, where uh, Isaac and Abraham together gives us the, one of the best pictures of Jesus is when God speaks to Abraham after he has this miraculous son. And he says that through that son, the whole world would be blessed. In many ways, Abraham's not only a type of God, Christ, he's a type of God, the Father. And God speaks to Abraham. I can read about this in chapter 22 of Genesis. He says, take your son, your only son, who you love. It's interesting he said your only son, because he had another son. 
only true son, and bring him unto the mountains of Moriah. Why couldn't he do it on a nearby mountain? He said he had to go to the mountains in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And he said, there, I want you to offer him there. Now, that seems like a really strange order because everything else God says in the Bible, he is against human sacrifice. He judged the other nations of Canaan because of human sacrifice. And here God asks Abraham to do this. I think Abraham knew it was a test of faith. He knew it was God's voice because they talked all the time. And so going through a great struggle, he doesn't wake up Sarah. He gets some servants. He gets some, the wood that he would need and what he would need to make a fire. And he wakes up Isaac. He says, come, we're going to sacrifice. Well, Abraham went from place to place. He often built altars. Isaac's not shocked by this. His father was a religious man. And he says, we're going to sacrifice. He doesn't tell him where. Isaac obediently follows. They go on a three days journey and they come to the mountains of Moriah. And the word Moriah means God will provide. And when they get to the foot of the mountains, he leaves the servants there and he says, the lad and I will come to you again. Three days journey to the foot of the mountains. Then they make a journey half a day up the mountain. On the way up the mountain and Isaac has the wood placed on his back, the wood for the sacrifice. It's really something. It's, it's uh, you know, when David sent Uriah with his own death warrant. And when evil people make someone about to be executed dig their own grave. And when Jesus had to carry his own cross that he would hang upon. And then, can you imagine when Abraham, who's now over 100, probably 117 or something, he has to, he says, I can't carry the wood. He puts the wood that is going to burn his son on his son's back. How do you think the father felt? when the cross was laid on his son's back. So this is a powerful analogy. They go up the mount mountain and Isaac, uh, he asks that immortal question. He's pretty sharp. They've done this before. He said, uh, Father, we've got the wood and we've got what it takes to make a fire, but where is the lamb? I don't know how many of you were here a couple of weeks ago when we had a communion service. And for those who are watching, I'll tell you real quick, we, you know, when we prepare for the Lord's Supper, the communion service, uh, everybody, the, the elders and the deacons and the pastors, we kind of stage when everything's set up inside. We walk in with a little bit of pomp and ceremony and we walk up front. We got the table here that's supposed to have all the emblems and the bread and, and everyone stands. And then when the pastors sit, the, the deacons and the elders sit. And we did this, and Pastor Ross and I and Boonsfer, we're up here and we're, uh, Brahman, sorry, and we're up here and we're, we sit down and, and there's nothing on the table. Do any of you remember that? There's no bread, there's no grape juice. As I was walking up and I looked at the table, I thought, maybe they got some new contraption where it will come up out of the table. And then we all go down, we sit down, and we're looking at this table, there's nothing on the table. We're supposed to have the Lord's Supper. And I'm thinking, maybe the pathfinders are gonna bring it out. I mean, all these things are going through my head, and Jean, Pastor Ross says to me, Doug, do you notice something's missing? I thought it was all under control until he said that. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, this is bad. Where is the lamb? <laughs> Well, it turns out we had so many extra people, they had to add extra grape juice and extra wine. It, it hadn't made it out yet, but it, you can imagine Isaac wondering, where is the lamb? Three days journey, then half a day's journey. A day with the Lord is like a year in prophecy. Jesus ministered for three and a half years to the place of sacrifice. When they get up to the mountain, Abraham explains to his son what needs to happen. And uh, Isaac is a willing sacrifice. Abraham didn't jump him from behind and hog tie him. He told him what the Lord had required and he submitted to his father, probably with some struggle, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he said, not my will, thy will be done. And Abraham laid his son on the altar, probably tied him so he wouldn't struggle. And just before the knife comes down, the angel calls out, We'll do another study on the angel of the Lord. 
It says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the child. Now I know. Now I know. Of course, God knows everything, but he was demonstrating for you and I today what his son was going to go through. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. That's why Jesus said, Abraham longed to see my day and he saw it. When did Abraham see the day of Christ? On the mountain when he was offering his son. He saw that God was offering his son and he realized what that offering was going to cost. These stories are all allegories about Jesus in the plan of salvation. The whole Bible is telling us about Jesus. I heard about a pastor that... Um, he was traveling a lot, and he was a seminary professor, and, and uh, always thinking about educating his two daughters, and he brought home this world map, and uh, he gave it to his girls. It was a puzzle of the world. He said, girls, if you put this together, you're going to know more about world geography than anything you're going to learn in school. It's got like a thousand pieces, so he gives it to them, and after a day of working on it, he walks by to see their progress, and it's pretty pitiful. Uh, they've got, you know, Missouri off in Europe. And they've got some, you know, Paraguays in North America. And they've got just, they're, they're trying to get these pieces together. The younger one finally gets all exasperated. She says, we're never going to get the world together. And she storms off. The older girl was staying there and she's studying the pieces. And she flipped one piece over and she saw a hand on the back of one of the puzzle pieces. She began to flip over other pieces and realized there was a picture on the back. They had re used a poster when they made the puzzle. On the back was a picture of a man. And she flipped over all the pieces and started putting them together and called her sister and she says, look at this. If we get the man together, we can get the world together. She said, if we get the man right, we will get the world right. And friends, that's the way it works in the Bible. If we can get the man right, the whole world comes together. The whole meaning of everything comes together. From beginning to, to the end, from cover to cover, this is telling us about Jesus and Him crucified. How many of you want to know more about that Savior?